You are very welcome along to the Olympic show here on OTB Sports, where we are celebrating gold for Ireland at the Olympic Games. You can count on one hand Ireland's post-war gold medalist. You got Ronnie Delaney, Michael Carruth, Katie Taylor, and now Fintan McCarthy and Paul O'Donovan have joined that most illustrious of lists. We're going to be celebrating over the next little while. Do get in touch on social media if you were up late into the night watching, if you recorded it and got up at six o'clock, and maybe, I don't know, how early is it to start the celebrations? Should we be cracking open the champagne? I suspect in Skibbereen it has been cracked open long before now. Lots more to get through as well. We'll be going to Tokyo in a few minutes. We'll also be checking in with the former Republic of Ireland international, Mark Kinsella. His daughter won a medal for for Team GB in gymnastics and Brendan O'Brien as well to run through everything that's happened in a glorious 24 hours for Ireland at the Olympic Games. This is the Olympic show. You'll get us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and on the OTB Sports app. It's all with thanks to Indeed who are proud to support Team Ireland at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Indeed believes the world works better when people are given every opportunity to unleash their true talents. You can use the hashtag talent unleash. But we want to talk gold. Paula Donovan, Fintan McCarthy, the early hours of the morning in Tokyo. Here's how it happened. Uh, world champions in uh, 2019 and a quarter. Green light, off they go. Expect the Germans to start swiftly, and indeed they've done just that in lane four. They were fastest out of the blocks in uh, their semi final. They're home and hosed. They're ahead by a length. It's Ireland from Germany, and history is made of the water in Tokyo as Vincent McCarthy and Paul O'Donovan win gold. Gold for Ireland. Gold for Ireland. Silver for Germany. And the Italians come home in third place. And that is one more chapter of magnificence from the men from County Cork. Brilliant. Sheer brilliant. There's never been an Irish rowing gold before. Gary and Paul O'Donovan won Ireland's first Olympic rowing medal, the silver in Rio. And now Paul with Fintan McCarthy has won Ireland's very first gold medal. RTE's George Hamilton with the commentary. The first time George Hamilton has commentated on an Irish gold medal at his 11th Olympic Games, which shows just how rare an achievement it is for Fintan McCarthy and for Paula Donovan. And to really start the celebrations here on the Olympic show, I'm delighted to be joined by two people very close to two gold medalists. Trish O'Donovan, Paul's mother, is with us. How are you keeping, Trish? Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also uh, Jake McCarthy, Fintan's brother, is with us as well. Congratulations, Jake. Thanks a lot. How are you doing? Uh, Trish, I, I went through the list of Irish gold medalists. It is such a rare achievement for Ireland to uh, get gold at the Olympic Games and to deliver at the world stage. Can you sum up your emotions when they finally went over the finish line? Oh, just that they got over the finish line was superb. And more so, I think, when the poor Norwegians capsized the day before at the um, semi-final, your heart is in your mouth until they cross the line because it can happen so easily and it's never a given that when they start that they'll finish. So it was superb. Have you had a chance to talk to Paul yet? No, I know she was in the middle of the night down out for them guys. <laughs> well, was he not straight on the phone afterwards? No, he's, no, he, like... Their phones were probably not even with them. They were probably back at the course or back at the hotel. Yeah. You know, and then they're doing their own thing. I don't know. Whether, I know I know. when we were in Rio, um, Paul got taken away for drug testing and we didn't see him for hours on end because he obviously Buddy was so dehydrated. It took him a while to, to give them the sample. So we didn't see Paul either. Right, right. So, you know, anything like that could happen. So you just leave them alone. And, I mean... You don't have to talk to them immediately, straight up, like, you know what I mean? That, that'll wait. They were yeah. exhausted anyway. Yeah, they, I, I, I've no doubt they were. Where did you watch it last night, Trish? Oh, here in the house, in the kitchen, yeah. Right. Uh, was there many there, or did you just want to have the close family? No, there wasn't, which you, you kind of can't really have any people mm. much, you know, so there was just six of us here. Right. And we did stand for the National Anthem, and we did sing it like we were would, um, would if we had been in Tokyo. So, um... Certainly, you could say we're uh, certifiably insane. <laughs> yeah, it, it's such a special moment, and even watching it myself, like when the Irish national anthem starts playing mm -hmm, for a gold mm -hmm, medalist, mm -hmm. it's it's an incredibly emotional thing. 
It sure is, yeah. And so to sort of take from that, you stand up and you sing it then, and then it sort of passes from you, you know. Yeah. It's Could... superb, superb. It's y- what they deserve, um, so it was great. Great achievement. And the whole parish is ecstatic. All morning long, their cars are hooting there as they're passing the road, you know. So Brilliant. everyone is chuffed and delighted, and, and rightly so. I mean, it's not every day you get a, an Olympic gold medal coming to the town, you know. No, it's certainly not. But the way things are going in Skibbereen, uh, it'll feel like every day soon, uh, the success that seems to be coming through. Jake, congratulations to you as well. Um, you've been there, you've been in the boat with Finton. You know the effort that he has put in to get to this level. You must be just incredibly proud. Yeah, yeah, we're we're all delighted here, you know. I was saying as well that, you know, I'd kind of, I guess I'd be behind the scenes firsthand, you know, because I'd be training with them day in, day out, you know, and it's just, yeah, it's inspiring really to see how they go about their business and conduct themselves as well, you know, like we can we can have the crack, but at the same time, you know, get the job done every day, you know, and that's, that's clearly what what helps him to win the gold. So, yeah, we're ecstatic here. Where were you watching last night? Uh, I was just at the house with the with the family, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, we can't really risk anything now with the virus and stuff, so I guess, yeah, we kind of just, made what we could of it uh, was there uh, any doubt at any stage uh, Trish was talking about obviously the Norwegians capsizing like things can go wrong and you know I, I think everyone expected that they would come towards the end and dominate but the Germans <laughs> they didn't go away in that last 500 metres yeah no um, I was saying I messaged I messaged one of the German stroke men there uh, this morning just because you know I've raced him before and uh, just to say you know congratulations I told him he was rolling a bit better as well, you know, because they, they took it to them for a lot longer than they usually would have, you know. Um, and, you know, like, fair dues to them in that regard. But, uh, yeah, luckily luckily the lads came through in the last last 500, but it was definitely cl- a closer call for sure. So I guess that just made it all the more exciting. Yeah. Uh, are you uh, a yard away from the TV in those final stages roaring? Yeah, yeah, we're... I was saying we were kind of going through stages during it, being like, okay, no, it's all good, it's all good, and then we'd be in hysterics the next minute, and then we'd be, you know, there's there's a lot of different things happening during those six minutes, but we got there in the end. Yeah. Uh, Paul's an awful fella, hasn't been in touch with his mammy. Have you been talking to Finton? <laughs> uh, we, we spoke to him briefly, all right, yeah. He was uh, he was actually getting drug tested, like Trish was saying, that yeah. Paul did the last time. Um, so, yeah, luckily he had his phone with him, and we got a, we got a quick... We called him there and he showed us the medal and stuff. Uh, so that was good. Um, that was nice, all right, just to, to see him before, before I guess, they begin their celebrations. You know? Yeah. Uh, have you gone down to town? Have you been around Skipperine today to, to see what it means to everybody? No, no, not yet. I've kind of, we've just been at the house. They've been, we've kind of been bombarded with, with uh, media stuff as well today. So we haven't been really even had the chance to leave. Um so yeah, but hopefully at some point now we'll get out and see. Uh, we've got so many messages, you know, as well, which is it's just great to see how it brings everyone together, you know. So yeah, um, it's really like it's a brilliant, brilliant thing. Trish, you've had some experience of this before with the success that Paul and Gary had over in Rio, and you got thankfully to enjoy that success uh, in in Rio. Uh, like the achievement for a town like Skibbereen to produce Olympic silver medalists in 2016, Olympic gold medalists and bronze medalists in 2021. For one small part of Ireland to go and dominate the world like that is, geez, it's hard to put into words. Um, I suspect that, and I know it to be the case, that when Paul and Gary um, did so well in Rio and actually brought home a, you know, a, 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 any Olympic medal, it wouldn't have mattered what it was. It made everybody, and Jake will, will be the first one to say, yes, we can do it. Why can't we? We're doing the same training program. And they all woke up and they all said, bloody hell, we can, we can have a shot at this. Yeah. And now we have six boats going to the Olympics this time. 2020-12, Ireland qualified one rowing boat to go to the Olympics. 2014, there was three boats. 2016, or here we are now, 2021 now, um, six boats went. That was never before in the history of Irish rowing ever happened before. <clears throat> the 
whole country stood up and said, goodness, if we get out there, if we train to the best we can, it is within our reach. And that's what's after happening. And so it's fantastic for the sport, for the clubs, for, you know, any of the coaches. Any, they're, they're all delighted. They're all thinking, gosh, yeah, it is doable. It is doable. It's not a sport that it loses us because up until 2016, they were coming in fourth, they were coming in fourth, they were knocking on the door, knocking on the door, and you, you kind of think, we're never going to be able to be up to the world standard that is expected. You know, we're trying, we're trying, we're trying, and we're not getting there. And they did get there, and look at what's after happening. Rowing has exploded. Mm. I, I think Trish Jake summed it up there that... You know, the, the lads, all of them have just brilliant personalities. And uh, from afar, you could look and go, you know, they're very relaxed and chilled out. But, like, this is incredibly tough work that they have to put in. You have to be so dedicated to get to the level that they've got to. When you look back at them growing up, was, was that dedication to sport, to whether it was education, whatever they did, did Paul and Gary always throw themselves fully into everything? 100, 100%, yes, they did. Um They'd go to training in the morning before they'd go to school. They'd go to school, uh, secondary school, obviously not in primary. Well, they did a little bit because obviously when they're young, they'd only go in maybe one day in the week, during the week, and then at the weekends. But then it progressed to um, training every day, twice on Saturday, um, Sunday training. And then it became morning and afternoon or morning and evening every day of the week, except on a Sunday. Um, So... It, you you just learned to work around it. Um, yeah. That's what they did. You accepted it. You didn't say, oh, look, I need you to be here because this is happening. You just say, they're not going to be here because they're training. And that's what has to happen. You have to accept that that's what they do if they're going to really put their heart and soul into this. And when they were, when they, when they first put on the green um, singlet in 2008 in Cardiff, and rode. They were only 14 and 15 and they were racing 18-year-olds. And they won. Yeah. And you st- you have to stand back. And as I did, I stood back and I went, this is just the beginning here, Trish. This is the beginning. They are going to go all the way to the top. You know, um, so uh, Paul and Pinton have done that uh, during the morning there. This was nighttime for them, for us. Um, during the morning, um, they did that. They, they went and they got the best, the pain, you know, that's it. The, the Olympic gold is there. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's funny, I was talking to Paul and Gary, maybe it was around this time last year during the first lockdown, and uh, I'd never met two men more comfortable with a lockdown who <laughs> were so focused, who suddenly actually didn't need to interact with the outside world right, at all, yeah, that yeah. they did their training, they yeah. were both studying hard, and like, you know, they're both uh, going go to go on and have really successful careers out of the water as well, but they were actually very happy just being in their own bubble. It suited yeah. them down to the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it really, like, the lockdown didn't really affect them at all, uh, you know, to a certain degree, because they just got on with their training. Yeah. Yeah. And that was it, you know, so fair play. Fair play to them. It's what they deserve, and I'm just really, really pleased that this is what, and they're showing the whole country and all the young athletes coming up, it is doable. We can do it. Pop. You know, 2024 is only three years away. So, you know, it'll make anyone, I'd say, I'd say if you went in out to the Green Run Club, they're probably all jumping into boats. <laughs> well, well, that uh, level of inspiration and, and legacy, Jake, like you're a prime example of that. I think you've said before yourself and Finton that, you know, saw rowing at the 2012 Olympics thought, yeah, we want to do that. The opportunity is there in Skibbereen. But also the inspiration of what Paul and Gary achieved in 2016 and been able to train alongside them every day and think, you know what? You don't need to be superhuman for this. You just need to work bloody hard. I don't know if Jake is there. Are you there, Jake? Sorry, you you caught up there. I I just missed the question. Sorry, sorry. I was just saying that we were talking about maybe the legacy um, of Paul and Gary, and you know the fact that you got into rowing yourself and Finton. You watched it at the Olympics in London in 2012, and then Paul and Gary winning silver in 2016. You were able to see up close and personal what you needed to do to become uh, an Olympian. The amount of work that went in. It was there was no magic there. It was just hard work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, like Trish said. Um, you know, like when you see, when you see, like when we saw the lads, obviously in Rio, 
uh, getting that silver medal, like, dead right. It's just like, well, why can't, why can't, you know, we do it? Why can't anyone really, you know? It's just about, yeah, I guess just about that dedication and and getting the best you can be and stuff. And um, hopefully now more people are going to, are going to uh, pick up the sport and we'll have more success in the years to come. Yeah. Uh, Trish, how, how's Gary been through all this? I think Paul said he was... So he he had gone to Tokyo as the reserve, but because he wasn't involved and because of COVID and all that, he had to actually fly home straight away. So unfortunately, he couldn't get to watch. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's very hard to... Yeah. You know, so we just have to... Keep an eye, hope that he'll be, you know, that it won't affect him in any serious way because it, it must be, it must be upsetting. Mm. It must be. But I know, they know, they know, they know that sport, they know what happens and that it's not as if it came out of the blue or anything. That's the way it is. But still, you know, the reality, it must be hard as well for Gary, so... Yeah, we'll be keeping an eye on him. Yeah, it, it, it must be somewhat tough for you as well as uh, as a mother because, you know, uh, you know, Paul has gone on and he's got his gold medal. But, you know, you've seen the effort that Gary has put in as well. I'm sure Gary has left nothing out there over the last okay. few years in his desperation to get in the boat. You see, and Jake will be, will be able to confirm this. Gary suffered an injury with his um, arm and I'm not taking away from Fint in any shape or otherwise. But anything can happen to set you back. So if you break a bone, Jake suffered an injury there and that's kind of slowed him back. It'll take a while to build up the stamina again. And, you know, it's but that's that's the nature. That's sport. That's how that's what happens. And you know, it that's the way it is. So it was good. It was good at least, you know, there was one of them in the boat, so that was good too. That is that is for sure. Yeah, Jake, there's there's no getting away. It is a strange dynamic in one way. Listen, an incredibly successful one that you had been in the boat with Finton and Gary and Paul have been in the boat together, and uh, then Finton and Paul end up as the ones going to the Olympians, uh, the Olympics. Like, are you looking at what they've achieved as as a real inspiration? Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Just even watching it last night, um, just the emotion, you know, and the impact it's had on everyone. It's just like really kind of motivates you to keep at it and hopefully get there one day you know like hopefully now we get over this injury and be able to to compete again and um we'll all we'll all keep at the training together you know and and go at it again for the next few years yeah uh Fintan was saying um in his post rate interviews that he was pretty chilled out uh ahead of the race that he was expecting to be a bit more nervous from what I've been reading you're very different characters that actually you would have expected him to be a bit more nervous he's uh, very organised likes everything to run to perfection you're the one who's usually a bit more chilled out so, uh, he's more chilled out was that, sorry I, you cut off again like, sorry uh, he, he was saying he was uh, a bit more chilled out than he uh, he normally would have been ahead of the race Um, I think having Paul with him as well you know it's it, it's been a good thing because he's very experienced, you know, and he's he's quite a cool customer um, himself. So I think he can kind of look to him a bit um, on that front and kind of, I guess, um, you know, vibe off him in that sense. Just, you know, this is what we've got to do and might as well be calm about it. Like, we can only go out and do, you know, the best we can. And we've done it so many times before. It's just, just another race, you know, and... Uh, but yeah, he, he'll get organised there in in other stuff, but it was good that he was able to keep cool in that situation, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Trish, obviously after 2016, Paul and Gary became pretty much worldwide superstars. They were, you know, they end up on the Graham Norton show. Everybody was uh, so taken in by uh, their personality and, and how relaxed they are after, after the race. Uh, Paul getting that balance of being the serious roar and professional and off the water being what seems like just an incredibly funny, relaxed character. Is, is, is that the way he's always been? Oh, what you see is what you get with Paul. Right. Mm -hmm. With the two of them, yeah. What you see is what you get, yeah. They're good. Yeah. They're, they're good lads. They're, they're better than good, I think it's uh, it's fair to say, Trish. Have you, have you any idea when they're going to when you're going to get to see them? No. Um, I was speaking with Michelle Carpenter there and she said she'd send me on the details of um, when they're due to arrive in um, so that we'll know... But, she didn't have details either this morning, so she'll send that on there when she get into the office. Yeah, you, you'll be offering to uh, keep the gold medal safe from. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> I'd be the last one they trust. I'd probably, 
I'd probably lose it. <laughs> uh, well, listen, Trish, uh, enjoy the next few days Thank and you. enjoy getting to see Paul. Uh, it's such a shame with COVID. We probably won't have a repeat of what we saw in Skibbereen back in no. 2016. Uh, no, not for no. the next little while, but maybe over ahead of Christmas, there can be a proper old... Uh, Skibbereen celebration but uh, congratulations thank the you. mother of an Olympic champion there's not many that can say that <laughs> thank you very much it's wonderful <clears throat> you know thank you so much well done Trish uh, enjoy it and uh, Jake thank you uh, as well are you what's the plan for getting back in the boat I think we're just having some technical difficulties with Jake are you gone Jake yeah, I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, Jake McCarthy uh, has just, the line is gone. Listen, they're down in Skibbereen. Uh, maybe the reception just isn't too good. Or half of Ireland wants to get in touch with him right now because his brother is the Olympic champion and Jake a world-class rower very much in his own right. And I'm sure uh, three years from now in Paris will certainly have ambitions of getting in one of those boats as well. But it is a day of real celebration on the Olympic show. Paul O'Donovan and Fintan McCarthy are the Olympic champions. There's not often we can say that in Irish sport. You are watching the Olympic show. We're live every single day here on Off the Ball, usually at five o'clock. But we started earlier today because we got gold and we wanted to get to it as quickly as we could. You can watch on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and on the OTB Sports app. It is all with thanks to Indeed, who are proud to support Team Ireland at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Indeed believes the world works better when people are given every opportunity to unleash their talents. You can use the hashtag Talent Unleashed. Now, let's go to Tokyo because a man who was waterside for the race and I think is nursing a little bit of sunburn back in the hotel is Brendan O'Brien from The Examiner. How are you keeping, Brendan? All good, Nathan. Yourself? Uh, you know, there can be long yeah. days in sports journalism and it can be some days where it's very much worthwhile. I'd say this is one of the days that that long trip, all the regulations around COVID, you couldn't care less about any of them. Absolutely, yeah. Um, the big, the biggest problem today was actually getting to the venue, which I've been to all week. But taxi drivers, as is tradition with major sporting events, they don't seem to know wh which way to go once you once you set up a couple of roadblocks for a sports tournament. But that aside, brilliant, brilliant occasion. Um, kind of a strange feeling going down there this morning because you know we, we've we've all witnessed a lot of great sporting Irish events, but it's very few where you actually turn up at the venue and you're thinking. This is a gold medal that we're we're looking at here, and I know I saw somebody on Twitter talking about, can we please stop talking about Olympians settling for a, a silver or a bronze? But let's be honest about it. If if the boys had have claimed a silver or a bronze today, um, there wouldn't be this outpouring of joy. I mean, these guys were the hottest of favourites, the hottest of hot hot favourites, and what really impressed me and what I loved about them was that it sat so easily on their shoulders. Um, all week, you know, on the boat, they were so serene, the world's best time in the semi-finals and off the boat as well. I mean, we all talk about it, we all see it. The lads just kind of leaning up against the crash barriers like they're, they're chatting over a fence on, on, on a Sunday. So, you know, a very special occasion. And yes, the impression I got was that it was a very businesslike one. They mean that in the best possible way that those guys were going there expecting to win. Um, and you take out the fact then that it was, there was no real crowd at it as well. It had that more kind of, um, you know, let's let's do the numbers here. Let's do what we're here to do. Let's do what we should. Let's do what we should do here. And uh, and that's the way it turned out. And again, look, that's not to take away from the the absolute joy in seeing an Irish boat going across the line first. Mm. Uh, that's something that's very striking. Is almost a lack of emotion. Uh, from the two of them. I, I don't know if it, maybe it was just in the television interviews, but that they're all business. They went there as the best in the world and they finished it as the best in the world. They did their job and now they just want to get home and celebrate. Yeah, and, and, and you know, when, when you're at the venue and you know yourself, you try and whoever scores the winning point or, or makes the, the winning save in the shootout, that's the guy or the woman to look at when the final whistle goes. And, you know, I kept my eye on, on the two lads as they went across the finishing line and it took a while for any sort of, you know, visible representation of joy to come about. It was probably caught on the TV, actually. And after a while, Finton raised the, the fist to the air and Paul kind of, you know, half turned behind him and gave him a little pat on the flanks, like a paternal pat on the flanks, as if to say, well done, son, your first Olympics. You haven't done too bad. Um, but, uh, yeah, like, the way the rowing is done this week as well with interviews it could be a good hour and a half by the time to get through and, and Finton was called in for the anti-doping afterwards as well. So it's not like we're getting them at the final whistle and the adrenaline is pumping through them. 
by the time they get even to us uh, on the print side things, they've done like six or seven interviews. But you can see in their demeanour, the first one they're doing, that it's all very, you know, well, yeah, we came here to do a job and, and we did it. And and Paul, Dun- Paul Donovan even, I think, I'm not sure, was it after the heat or the semi-final? He's very much upfront about this, like, you know, yeah, winning medals is great. And he's spoken about this before as well. Winning medals is great, but, like, you move on. And the Olympics is great, but you move on. Um, you know, and I've no doubt win, lose or whatever, had they been tipped over in the in the waters like the Norwegian crew was during the week, that they would have got back up and they would have prioritised the next major championship in Paris in 2024. It's just what they do. And and I described it today in the online piece I did as a, a very un-Irish, Irish success story, that it's a lack of kind of, you know, this bolt from the blue or, or um, you know, a, a kind of an underdog story. Ireland beat the Germans by being the Germans. Do you know what I mean? Mm. We were the machine. Mm. We were the guys who would not be beaten. The Germans were the Irish in the way that they absolutely flew out of the blocks. I mean, how many times have we said about an Irish rugby team, you know, 20, 30 minutes of pure fury, and then the wind would come out of them. Now, fair play to the Germans. They stuck there till the end. But it was the Irish crew who got a decent start themselves, and they stuck to their metronomic pace. They stuck to their plan. They were like... You guys can go as hot as you want. We're sticking to what we do. They stuck to the plan and pulled through it. It was just, it was it was very un-Irish in that sense for me. And going in as raging hot favourites, Cahill Dennehy was on ahead of the start of the Olympics and you know making that point that we've never had uh, an Olympic hope like this. Even when we think back to Katie Taylor and all the expectations, there was a little bit of heading into the unknown because it was the first time women's boxing had been at the Olympics. Whereas Paula Donovan, in particular, like we we are probably talking about one of, if not our greatest sports star with, what, four world championships, a silver medal and a gold medal, our greatest ever Olympian. T- to have that weight of expectation and to just seem to be able to brush it aside and take no notice, again, it's just so... It goes against everything we've ever been brought up with, what Irish sport is. Absolutely. And, and listening to his mum talking there and saying, what you see is what you get with Paul. And I've actually had texts and WhatsApps from home from friends and people saying, is this really this this guy off the camera? I mean, are we seeing the real guy? Is this, nobody could be that impossibly cool before or after a game or after a, an Olympic event and do it. And, and look, everything I've ever seen, all I'd say is if that's a mask, they're the greatest actors ever because... Time and time again, they go up in front of a camera. They waltz from camera to camera. They waltz around the place. They literally look like two guys out for a Sunday stroll. There's no bother on them. And that's obviously helped them, Nathan. I mean, um, I heard one of the guys earlier talking about saying that maybe Paul's influence has rubbed off on Finton in that way. That there is this, it's not an air, an air of supreme confidence. It's not an air, an air of supreme cockiness. It's just trust in the process, trust in the work you've done. They know the program is excellent. They know they have a bit of talent, not that they'd ever say that. And that's enough for them. They, you know, they don't have to do anything else. They don't have to put on a show. And in fact, the greatest cloak that they have, the greatest aura they have is the lack of aura. It's the ordinariness of, of these guys as they go up on the blocks at the start of a race. Um, there's a very interesting quote in the main um, press conference afterwards in, in the media center, um, uh, or maybe it's called then he actually got one of the Czech guys and the Czech guys um, finished a whisker off a bronze medal and yet 10 seconds off the Irish crew. And uh, the Czech rower described Paula Donovan as a monster. And that's exactly it. He's a, he's a once in a generation, once in a multi-generation talent. Um, and, you know, this is premature. I mean, he hasn't won as many as, as this man, but he's our Steve Redgrave. And you could look nearly at, at McCarthy as the Matthew Pinson, as a guy who would be the main man, worry not, with the other main man, who was the main man of all main men. It's an incredible crew, and there's so much has come right for them. But I do think that attitude that they bring to it, that that comfort in what they do. And and the, the, the crazy thing about it, Nathan, is you look at 40 minutes after their race, Sunita Pushpura wasn't as hot a favourite, but everybody expected her to win gold. Mm. And you look, you, you look at her crouched over in utter despair in her boat, having finished fifth in the semi-final, having looked so serene all week as well. I mean, herself and the two boys were on parallel paths. They looked unbeatable. And yet one gets to the final and crushes it, and the other gets to the semi-final, and it all falls apart. And it just shows we've seen that with so many Olympians, not just Irish, but in an Irish context context with uh, Philip Doyle and Ronan Byrne, Jack Woolley. Um, I'm leaving somebody else out, the, the Rugby Sevens guys who 
who have talked about being embarrassed at their performances. I thought that was a bit heavy on themselves. But it just goes to show you that on the big stage, it doesn't always come through. But the great magic of these two lads is that it always does. And I don't know how to do that. Mm. It's just all in the work, I think, is what they always seem to say. And like, you think of the Kilkenny hurlers and their greatness and Brian Cody being asked what's the secret and like there is no secret they're just out there and they're working harder probably than anybody else you mentioned Sunita Prasport we'll get on to the disappointment of now but um, Paula Donovan's mother Trish touched on it there you think of where Irish rowing has come from and 2012 in London and Sunita Prasport is the only Irish rower who qualifies for those games to go from there to already having one bronze and a gold uh, to becoming one of the dominant nations in world rowing. Like what's happened and what Dominic Casey and what Skibbereen has given to this country in sport. Uh, we probably still don't talk about it enough. Maybe we will now that we have the gold medal. Yeah, and you know what? We will for a certain amount of time and then the Olympics will finish and these lads will sink back into a little bit of obscurity. They'll just go away and, you know, do their own thing, like maybe win a couple of world championships and... Europeans and we'll kind of give them a mention in our papers and on radios and you know we'll be more more exposed to the Premier League and the GA and the Six Nations um, and look they know that's the way it is um, but it is an incredible journey and it's one that's continuing and, and talking to a lot of the crews before the games um, one thing that was always mentioned was the under 23s that are in training with them and how those crews are pushing them along as well um, you look at the B final um, today for Casey and Kremen, two 22-year-olds who have finished eighth in their event. Um, eight was always like the, the, the top level in, in rowing. If you finish in the top eight, that's the elite of the elite. They're three years away from Paris, Nathan, you know. That's mm -hmm. another crew that's coming mm -hmm. online. You talked about Jake there and Gary O'Donovan. There's more reserves beside out, besides out here as well this week. There is incredible depth in it. And... You have Dominic Casey over the lightweight side. You have the Italian coaches over the other side. Um, you have a lot of good stuff going on. And um, it's it's interesting as well that Jake would have, uh, Finton would have spoken about watching the lads in Rio in 2016 and how that spurred them on. Imagine what the younger crews are thinking now as they watched everything they saw this week. Um, you know, that's a lot of motivation to pull in for a group of people who can already see that the system is... It's five years on from where it is. So the crazy thing about it is as well, we mentioned Sunita and we mentioned the two lads in, in the double skulls. You know, it could have been actually even better. And that's not to, 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 to water down anything that's been done. But, you know, this could have been even better. I mean, this isn't um, overachieving. This is kind of maybe par for the course as to what we expected. Yeah, and as you mentioned, uh, it was um, it's <laughs> tough listening to Trish talking about uh, Gary and you know Gary having to fly back from Japan because he was there as the reserve and you know having to keep a bit of an eye on him because as happy as he will be for his brother, the disappointment of not being in the boat alongside him and what motivation that will be for him for three years' time in Paris. Absolutely, and and again, you mentioned the rest of the reserves, um, Aileen Crowley and Monika Dukarska who were in the pairs this week, they had turns in, in the women's four boat as well. Um, you know, a few of us were talking to the to the coaches there and the process of whittling down the best four for um, for uh, for the women's four, which happens in the men's as well. So you look at it, I think it was 2019, I think it was Aileen Crowley was in that boat. Yeah, uh, there's, uh, you're, you just broke up there for a second, Brendan. There's uh, clearly incredible uh, depth. Uh, you touched on Sunita Prespoor because uh, while she wasn't the raging hot favourites that the lads were, there was definitely an expectation that she would medal and could well be a gold medal and has ended up not making the final. I don't know if you got a chance to talk to her afterwards or what the general vibe or what went wrong. No, we, we, we actually didn't get to talk to her. We, we, we obviously, we expected to have a word with her afterwards and, and we asked the media crew, could we? And what we were told was that she was just too devastated to speak, um, that she wouldn't be speaking. Um, very understandable. I mean, I, I can't imagine the depth of the emotions that she was going through. I mean, the last time we spoke to her was earlier in the week after she qualified for the semi-final. And if you remember in 2012 and 2016, she actually went out in the quarter final stage. So she actually mentioned... I think it was to RTE about breaking that curse, about getting through to the semi-final level. And and yet here we go again. Um, look, we, we don't know until we actually hear from her or some of her coaches. Um, fifth in a semi-final is so far below where we thought she would be. 
She's in her late thirties now. I think she's she, um, given consideration to quitting before 2021 when when the uh, the Olympics were put back a year. So, you know, she still has a B final tomorrow. Have we seen the last of Sunita? If that's the case, I mean, she's given absolutely everything to to Irish rowing. She was obviously the only boat that we had in um, in Dorney Lake in in London in 2012. And um, even speaking to some of the female rowers this week, they have spoken about how they looked up to seeing Sunita in London nine years ago. So, look, again, like we're talking about, and again, it puts into perspective what the two lads have done with the gold. You can prepare all you like, you can do everything right, and at the end of the day, it just doesn't click for you when you need it most. Uh, I know you were, and the way Olympics work, you're focusing on the rowing. It's very hard to keep up with everything that's going on. I don't know if you saw much else of what was happening. Obviously, for the sailors, it seemed there were a real mixed day. Robert Dixon and uh, Sean Waddle were disqualified. There was an issue with their boat, so they went from 7 to 13th. But Annalise Murphy, who obviously has given us so much over the last couple of games, she had a really slow start and was really down herself after the first few days, but first and second in her race today and has maybe given herself an outside chance, certainly in making the final and maybe, depending on how things go putting herself back in the reckoning for a medal yeah it's incredible like when you think it's her third olympics that it shows you how the big occasion can i won't say get to people but how, how it can have an effect i think it was 35th in her first race and she spoke afterwards about you know maybe trying too hard or maybe taking a bit easier a different tack or a different approach that's a you know somebody who nearly had a medal in um in, in london and did medal in in rio highly experienced sailor in all forms of sailing um, so, look, incredible, incredible resolve to come back and put herself into this position to do what she's done. And again, showing her experience. And with two lads in the 49ers, I mean, your heart would have to break for them. Um, I was looking it up. They're 90 grams overweight. And I tried to get a comparison of what 90 grams would be. And 100 grams is basically the weight of two boiled eggs. So right. if you are going to, if you are going to lose your, or, or you know, put a huge dent in your boat and your Olympic amb ambitions for that kind of weight, it must be devastating because they had such a great day today as well. Now, I, I don't know enough about the sailing. It's, it goes on over a long time. Um, and it's hard to keep up with it when you're covering everything else in Tokyo, but they've, they've gone to 13th or 14th. They've six races left, so sounds to me like it's still in their hands. But, I mean, my God, just, just, just to be able to kind of move on from that would be a big test for them. Mm. Um, and hopefully they can do it because you'd hate for them to miss out in the final or something as, as small as that. There are still plenty of medal hopes, uh, potentially the golf. So the golf, the men's golf has started. Uh, Rory McIlroy, six shots off the lead. Shane Lowry is a further shot back. It is the Austrian Step Straka, who is about 160th in the world, who's leading, uh, set the pace, a lightning quick start on eight under par. But McIlroy and Lowry still right in it. Uh, but we have a gold medal and a bronze medal in the last two days. I look at the golf, the boxing, like there's still plenty to look forward to even ahead of the start of the athletics, Brendan, over the next week or so. Absolutely. And, and you know, you can look at um, maybe the show jumping team. Carl Daniels is out in action tomorrow in the eventing. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving one or two people out, but there, there is still hope. I mean, tomorrow we have a couple of boxing hopes, maybe get a couple of guaranteed medals. I, I think five or six medals would be a, a more than acceptable return for this team. Like I say, with the, the rowers, I mean, we have two very good crews now who were very highly tipped. Um, and it just goes to show how difficult it is. The boxers, it'd be great to see them get a couple of medals after everything that happened to them in Rio. Um, we spoke with the rowers taking over as the so-called um, medal factory for, for Irish Olympians. Um, and just looking at the boxers tomorrow, actually, you know, it's interesting who they're fighting. Aidan Walsh is um, up against um, a Mauritius boxer. And I know again getting a few um, tidbits from home. People are saying we well, should win this, and just to, just to point out that Mauritius have won one medal in the Olympic Games. That was in boxing back in 20, uh, 2008 um, when when a guy got bronze. So you know I wouldn't be wouldn't be counting any chickens yet. And that guy Mervyn Clare actually beat the fourth seed Jordanian in, in the previous bout. So um, as impressive as Aidan Walsh was in the first one, I'd be I'd be careful about you know, kind of expecting that to happen. And then Kelly Harrington, when she fights for the first time, obviously got a bye in the first round. She's up against an Italian who's only who's only boxing five years. She's a 21-year-old, doesn't have a, a huge CV to speak of in, in major championships, but she's come out and said that her ambition is to win a medal in, in the Tokyo Olympics. So um, <clears throat> on paper, you'd be saying there are two bouts that they should be winning. So we'll see how that goes. 
Uh, on tomorrow's show, we're going to talk two, three Olympians. Uh, Nat Nguyen and boxers Emma Brennan and Michaela Walsh are going to talk to us and we'll obviously follow on the, on everything uh, that happens overnight. So much of the talk ahead of the games was obviously around the actual games going ahead, Brendan, and uh, the apathy that was there in Japan for the games going ahead. You've been there for a week more at this stage. What's the general vibe around Tokyo? Um, well, around around our section of Tokyo, which is uh, media centres and venues, it's all very, very good. Um, we're obviously in what you would call a kind of an Olympic slash hotel bubble for the first 14 days while we're here, which means we can't go to a restaurant, we can't go to uh, a bar, we're technically not meant to be going into shops or whatever. It's actually interesting how that's all worked and that it's not quite as strict as that. There are stories of people jumping into cabs on the street um, cabs being shared, um, that it's not the the iron curtain that you would have thought it was. But that said, I do think there is quite a good honour system over here that I've seen with people have spoken to that, look, you know yourself, Nathan, you're so bloody busy at these at these events. You're back at 10 or, 10 or 11 at night. You don't have time to be going to do too, too much karaoke. But um, it's, it's hard to tell the vibe. I mean, even viewership figures in... Japanese TV are, are very, very healthy. You know, there's talk of 100 million Japanese. I think four days ago I'd watched some part of the Olympics. Um, but look, there's no doubt about it. It makes for a very strange experience. I mean, we started off talking about the rowing today and it just struck me, I'm sure you've all seen on the screens in the background of the rowing venue, you see the big Tokyo Gate Bridge and the traffic is going on and it's just that backdrop of the city going about its business. And I feel, I feel terrible for the people here because they're going to have to shoulder the bill for all of this and they don't get any of the joy and anybody who's been to a major sports sports event you know you can't put your your finger on what it is but there is that vibe that excitement and okay you're going to be left with a, a blooming huge bill at the end of it but you're going to have the best two weeks or month of your life and it's just not there and, and for those of us who are here in in tokyo and and japan for the world cup in 2019 it's just a shadow of the city that it was you can see that in, in the lack of traffic you can see it when you do get your 15 minutes to go out to the local family mart or 7-Eleven to get your, your bit of gorgeous sushi for your, for your evening meal, it's just not the same. It's not the same city. So, you know, how, how Japanese people really feel, it, it's, it's impossible to say. It's impossible to say. Yeah. Well, look, Brendan, it's not every day you see Irish athletes win gold at the Olympics. So today, one of the better days, I'm sure, at the job. Thanks a lot for joining us, as always. Anytime, lads. Enjoy. Uh, Brendan O'Brien there from the Irish Examiner coming live from Tokyo. He had been waterside, oh, well, what, 12 hours ago at this stage when Ireland won gold at the Olympic Games through Paul O'Donovan and Fintan McCarthy. This has been the Olympic show. We are going to be back tomorrow, as I mentioned, we'll bring you through everything that's happened overnight uh, in the boxing, the golf, and also Nat Nguyen, Emma Brennan and Michaela Walsh, all of whom have already competed at this year's Olympics, are going to join us on the show as well. Five o'clock every evening for the next couple of weeks. We're going to be live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and the OTB Sports app. It is all with thanks to Indeed, who are proud to support Team Ireland at the Tokyo 2020. 20 Olympics indeed believes the world works better when people are given every opportunity to unleash their true talents. You can use the hashtag Talent Unleash. What a day it has been. What an Olympic show it's been. Thanks for joining us. You can listen back to all those joyous family members. Ireland have got gold at the Olympic Games. The Olympic show on OTB Sports with Indeed, proud partner of Team Ireland.